Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rustem, and today uh, I'm planning to tell you how we uh, can use medium resolution imagery to detect missing buildings. Uh, I'm working at Astra Digital. Uh, we uh, operate small satellites and have, spot have platform for easy access to the data and analytics on top of it. Also, we uh, provide data to open aerial map. Well, you have seen before. The picture here is Los Angeles. So just to give you an example that even like in developed country, a popular city can be sometime undermapped. Uh, we know that uh, OSM is the biggest uh, data source of uh, uh, geospatial data, but still uh, a lot of areas are uh, undermapped. It can happen because some cities or towns are just unpopular and there is uh, no recent image or it's just like not enough mappers who are interested in this area. Sometimes it's problems that uh, natural disasters or rapid change and uh, you have to have the most recent image. And third, sometimes there are spam buildings from malicious users. So uh, here on the picture you see Colorado University. Uh, on the right, you see digital globe image. On the left, you see Sentinel-2, 10 meter resolution. Although we can agree that on the right, it's a lot easier to uh, distinguish buildings, there are advantages to using uh, medium resolution imagery on the left to uh, detect buildings. First of all, uh, we uh, receive every image every five days, meaning that we always have the most recent image with the most recent changes. And second, which is more important, uh, we can use this kind of frequency to build time series of pattern and analyze this pattern to distinguish buildings. Second is that we uh, have very good coverage with uh, Sentinel imagery, meaning that even small towns or uh, cities in developing countries are covered and you see the most recent image. And also we have a good historical archive of data, meaning that uh, we can compare patterns between years to un understand what have changed. Uh, let me tell a bit more about off-pattern activity. Here you can see uh, Seoul Airport in uh, Korea, and uh, uh, there is a park near it. And uh, if uh, we can just like visually uh, analyze it uh, during 2016 and compare it to 2017, we will see that it has a standard uh, pattern during 2016, uh, no vegetation in the beginning of the year, high vegetation in the middle of the year. And, but even uh, starting with uh, 2017, even uh, during March, we can see that something is different. And uh, uh, this kind of comparison can lead us to believe that uh, this park uh, was destroyed and uh, like, uh, some construction started in this area. And uh, this kind of uh, pattern analysis can be done automatically uh, without any human input and it's very easy to compare. Uh, in general, our algorithm uh, which we used uh, works in the following way. Uh, we build a time series for uh, all, every pixel, uh, remove uh, random noise, clouds, uh, and so on. Then we use uh, this data for the whole spectre plus geometric features to segment, uh, the, uh, the pixels, to segment pixels into segments. And then we, uh, based on these segments, create candidates and then we, uh, based on how these candidates are similar to already uh, predicted, uh, already known OSM data, we can uh, label uh, these candidates. The problem here is that still with this kind of model, uh, we won't get a universally, uh, universal algorithm which will work everywhere. Uh, for example, uh, algor uh, um, algorithm which I just mentioned, it worked good with uh, Dubai and Las Vegas, but didn't work as good uh, with Guangzhou in China. Part of it uh, was uh, uh, high cloudness because it reduced number of images per year, and part of it was a different, uh, uh, st um, different type of uh, area. So, uh, by this moment, this kind of algorithm and model, uh, they produce two types of basically, two types of output. First, uh, ranked uh, building uh, candidates, which is practically vector data, with uh, ranking meaning that uh, how a model is sure is this area a building or not. And second, of pattern areas, where we know that something changed. We may not uh, know if it's like a building or not, but we know that change is significant. So to solve it, uh, and uh, one of the best ways is to add human in the loop. So human in the loop allows uh, to control accuracy to verify ranked candidates or 
find what happened exactly in changed area. Um, if, uh, so this kind of analysis um, allows us to build this kind of feedback loop. So uh, we use uh, users, so model pro uh, produces results, uh, then a user uh, validates results and uh, passes it back to the model and model retrains and show, shows to the user updated results. That way, the uh, user doesn't ha uh, have to uh, validate 100 results. He can validate 10 or 15 with the same result. And model, overall, produces a lot better results than without human supervision. Here, uh, here's an example how we did it with Dubai. Basically, we created a grid over Dubai and overlaid it with OSM data and asked user to only uh, uh, check uh, cells in the grid where OSM data is complete. And by just validating 10 to 15 uh, tiles out, out of this grid, we were able to produce this mask. Which, and uh, as a next step, user could validate this mask, like tiles where this mask worked great. So uh, this kind of uh, feedback loop is uh, enabled by our analytical pipeline, where they use our, uh, where we use satellite imagery and uh, labeled but incomplete data to train the model, and then uh, basically uh, by, by validating results of the model with the user, uh, retraining the model. Uh, the upside that, uh, is that we were able to uh, make the whole cycle of interaction with user in under a minute, meaning that for the user uh, process still kind of remains uh, interactive. So, uh, in conclusion, I want to say that moderate resolution can be used for building detection and uh, for uh, finding areas with uh, change. That building detection can be automated uh, with human in the loop, uh, but uh, exactly we, in terms of active learning. So it's not like we just pass validation data to the user. We make a, sec a second step and pass that data back to the model. And uh, this kind of approach uh, can help significantly to improve OSM data and editing workflows. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, I would be glad to ask. <laughs> oh, answer. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of questions, actually. So. First of all, you mentioned uh, training. What kind of uh, machine learning are you using here? Uh, what framework? So uh, for first uh, step where we just uh, wanted to uh, unite uh, based on uh, values, here we just use uh, uh, basically KNN, where we use uh, existing OSM data to produce this kind of clusters. And then we kind of divide all candidates into these clusters. Thanks. So, uh, and then how do you trans transform these into polygons? Uh, yeah, so once candidates are validated, uh, we can uh, basically uh, just uh, binarize uh, like building and uh, just create polygon. And based on values, so uh, based on value of each pixel, we can calculate uh, uh, like the trust, uh, trustlyhood of uh, the whole polygon. Okay, so uh, have you considered using deep learning, for instance? Yes, so basically uh, the part uh, where we use, like here, uh, this is somewhere we, we use deep learning. The problem with deep learning is uh, that it doesn't work in the same way with medium resolution imagery as it works with high resolution imagery. So it's um, less connected with geometric uh, uh, features with medium resolution, but it uh, works in a good way when you uh, basically have to classify. Because overall, what you get is basically a time series for each pixel. And uh, after that, it's just additional feature which, for which you want to just classify each pixel, basically. And then you can use uh, computer vision techniques to segment the whole data on the picture. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Uh, how can we get access to your uh, data? I mean, the satellite imagery and uh, 
these masks, masks for uh, changed data and changed buildings? Or uh, is that a kind of a private data and we can't get it right now? We're a commercial company, so it's something we, which we are open to discuss. Uh, but especially like the whole process, the whole like this approach, so Sentinel-2 data is free. It's accessible via AWS uh, S3, uh, so via bucket, so it's very easy to download. And the whole approach is recreatable because like, uh, let me find the, um, uh, because you don't need to have like, to, nothing commercial happening here. So it's like, you have like data which is like open, you have OSM data which is like obviously open. Yeah, but the imagery, is that also open? I mean the... Sentinel-2 is open imagery, uh, it's, uh, uh, so basically here, Joe, who is actually like one of the guys uh, who responsible for Sentinel on a, a lot of data on AWS uh, S3 buckets. So, uh, ah, okay. everything so, is so, accessible. So yeah, it's accessible via Amazon and... Uh, it's free to download. Yeah, cool, cool. Thanks. Well, also on Google Cloud. <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions, I will be glad to ask during break. And also you can ask David, because we worked on this project together. So, yeah. Thank you very much.